Ayodhya. It is invincible to enemies. Adi Purana. It is untouchable for sins. Satya Pakhyana. It is unbeatable by anyone. Atharva Veda. Ayodhya, prominent among the 16 Mahajanapadas. The extraordinary land where reality blends into imagination. The soil where gods and goddesses blend with ordinary folk as if in an extended family. Even the god here is a citizen endowed with legal rights. History and faith, truth and myth travel together here, even in the 21st century. Politics and religion always kept armed vigil here to settle old debts and carry out ancient promises, all for the sake of power. Ayodhya goes on through revenge and retribution, war and wealth, lust and love, eroticism and asceticism. A journey through Ayodhya's hoary past as a new temple rises exactly where the Mughals are believed to have destroyed an ancient temple to build a masjid. Once upon a time, Ayodhya was an obscure ancient town. Yet the story of Sri Ram originated in this tiny land, thrived as the dominant faith in South Asia for more than 2,500 years. This story had different versions and interpretations in all Indian languages. It has travelled across Asia with popular versions appearing in a host of countries ranging from Japan, China and Indonesia to Thailand, Cambodia, Laos and Nepal. There is not one but more than 300 Ramayanas. Buddhists of Cambodia, Muslims of Indonesia, Shintoists of Japan, Dai people of China and even the Mapilas of Malabar have Ramayanas of their own. अब मुझे लगता है कि अयोध्या का जो सांस्कृतिक और जो उसका आध्यात्मिक महत्व है जो उसका माइथोलॉजिकल और स्पिरिचुअल एस्पेक्ट है वो हमेशा से मौजूद रहा है 1573 में ऐसा मान्यता है कि गोस्वामी तुलसीदास ने बालकांड यहाँ लिखा रामचरितमानस का और बालकांड लिख करके फिर वो काशी गए और उन्होंने रामचरित पूरी की लेकिन फिर हमें ये देखना चाहिए कि जिस जिस ग्रंथ को जिस एपिक को वो लिख रहे थे जनमानस के लिए वो बाद में धर्म ग्रंथ बना और एक पूरी एक संस्कृति भारत की चली जो रामायण बेस है जो 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 Ayodhya of the epics, one of the seven most sacred cities to the Hindus, one among the Moksha Deni Saptapuras. The royal capital of the prehistoric Kosala Empire. The seat of the Ishkvaku dynasty, the land that believed to witness not just the birth but the death of the law. Ayodhya, it was Saket, the prominent Buddha Jain center until the 6th century BCE. The land through which Gautama Buddha and Mahavira traveled, the birthplace of five Jain Tithankaras. Much before the time of empires, Ayodhya too consisted of multiple and tiny principalities. When the native tribes continued to remain in their traditional forest dwellings, a new Vedic community arose practicing agriculture and trade. A community using copper tools and weapons instead of those made with animal bones and wood came into being here. Ayodhya ada dua tarat terlalu ceritera mundu. Orang 
നാം മനസ്സിലാക്കുന്ന രൂപത്തിലുള്ള ചരിത്രം രണ്ട് ആർക്കിയോളജിക്കൽ ചരിത്രം അപ്പോൾ ആർക്കിയോളജിയാണ് ഇപ്പോൾ എന്ന് എന്ന് എല്ലാ ആൾക്കാരും കൂടുതൽ മനസ്സിലാക്കുന്നതും അതാണ് കൂടുതൽ ഉൾക്കൊള്ളുന്നതും അപ്പോൾ അതിൻ്റെ അടിസ്ഥാനത്തിൽ ആർക്കിയോളജിക്കലി ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇപ്പോൾ ആയിരത്തി ഇരുന്നൂറ് ബി സി വരെ പോകുന്ന ഒരു ചരിത്രം ഈ ഉദ്ഘനം ചെയ്ത സ്ഥലത്തുണ്ട് പക്ഷേ ഈ സ്ഥലത്ത് നിന്ന് മറ്റ് സ്ഥലത്തേക്ക് പോവുകയാണെങ്കിൽ ചിലപ്പോൾ അതിനേക്കാൾ പഴയ സ്ഥലത്തുള്ള ചരിത്രവും കിട്ടാൻ സാധ്യതയുണ്ട് Agriculture used to thrive in the region since prehistoric days. The village formed the core of habitation. Small trade centers named Negam was common. Minor ports attached to the rivers. These habitations grew into towns and larger towns as civilization advanced. Yet No archaeological evidence substantiates the existence of the mega city of Ayodhya as described in Ramayana. Lord Ram's Ayodhya should be another place drowned in Saryu, said Govind Acharya, the RSS ideologue some time ago to a journalist. രാമായണത്തിൽ പറയുന്ന പല തരത്തിലുള്ള നഗരവീതികളെക്കുറിച്ച് പറയുന്നുണ്ട് അങ്ങനെയുള്ള നഗരവീതികളൊന്നും ഇതേവരെ ആർക്കിയോളജിക്കൽ എക്സ്കവേഷനിൽ കിട്ടിയിട്ടില്ല അതിന് മറ്റു സ്ഥലങ്ങൾ എക്സ്കവേറ്റ് ചെയ്യേണ്ടി വരും ആ എക്സ്കവേറ്റ് ചെയ്തതിന് ശേഷം മാത്രമേ ഒരു പൂർണ്ണ രൂപം നമ്മുടെ മുമ്പിൽ മനസ്സിലാവുകയുള്ളൂ അപ്പോൾ ഞങ്ങൾ ഈ സ്ഥലം മാത്രമേ ഇപ്പോൾ എക്സ്കവേറ്റ് ചെയ്തിട്ടുള്ളൂ അത് ഏതത് ടു പോയിൻറ്റ് ടു സെവൻ ജോ ഏക്കർ ഏരിയ അത് മാത്രം അതും ജന്മസ്ഥാൻ എന്ന് പറയുന്ന സ്ഥലത്താണ് എക്സ്കവേറ്റ് ചെയ്തത് ഇതിനും രണ്ട് മൂന്ന് എക്സ്കവേഷൻസ് ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു ഒന്ന് ബനാറസ് യൂനി ഹിന്ദു യൂണിവേഴ്സിറ്റി എ കെ നാരായണൻ പ്രൊഫസർ എ കെ നാരായണൻ്റെ കീഴിൽ ഒരു എക്സ്കവേഷൻ ചെയ്തിരുന്നു അതിന് ശേഷം രണ്ടാമത് പ്രൊഫസർ ബി ബി ലാലിൻ്റെ കീഴിൽ മറ്റൊരു എക്സ്കവേഷൻ സെവൻറ്റി സിക്സ് സെവൻറ്റി സെവനിൽ ചെയ്തിരുന്നു ആ എക്സ്കവേഷനിലായിരുന്നു ഞാൻ പാർട്ടിസിപ്പേറ്റ് ചെയ്തിരുന്നത് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ കീഴിലായിരുന്നു ഈ എക്സ്കവേഷൻ ന നടത്തിയിരുന്നത് അപ്പോൾ അതിന് ആ അവസരത്തിലാണ് ഈ വിവാദ ഭൂമിയായ പള്ളിയുടെ കീഴിലുള്ള കീഴിലുണ്ടായിരുന്ന ആ തൂണുകൾ കിട്ടിയിട്ടുള്ളത് The Chinese monk who visited Ayodhya during the 5th century wrote that there were Buddhist pillars but no large temples with high spires before the 6th century. Huan Tsang, who came two centuries later, saw scores of monasteries with hundreds of Mahayana and Hinayana Buddhists and nearly 10 Hindu temples. According to Hans Becker, a Dutch Indologist and historian, Saket, said to be the other name of Ayodhya, was a culturally developed center of ancient India. As per the archaeological studies held in 2000, Ayodhya had passed four or more stages of history during the period between the 7th century BCE and 7th century CE. The Shunga Empire, based in Magadha-controlled areas from the 2nd century to the 1st century BCE. This period witnessed the first phase of structural construction occurred in this region. The time belonged to Pushyamitra, the founder of the Shunga dynasty, who declared one gold coin for every Buddhist head. It marked the first major Brahminical advance towards erasing every trace of Buddhism from the empire. Ayodhya came under the Kushan rule from the 1st century to the 3rd century CE. Archaeological excavations showed that Kushans were responsible for extensive constructions done in unknown architectural styles. Ayodhya became the capital of the Gupta Empire that reclaimed Vaishnava Hindutva hegemony, decimating Buddhist dominance. Skanda Gupta, who claimed Lord Ram's direct lineage, moved his capital from Pataliputra to Ayodhya. However, the 6th century witnessed the sun setting on Ayodhya with the decline of the Gupta Empire triggered by the invasion by the Huns. The city gradually moved to oblivion, 
Silence shrouded Ayodhya for the next five centuries. Until the 11th century, when the Garadavala dynasty of Kanauj came into prominence, catapulting the Vaishnava faith once again to glory. The western portion and also the southern portion was excavated. There we could get the pillar bases, the brick bases on which this pillar stood. So there were many pillar bases like that one. And some of the sculptures, sculptures mean the terracotta sculptures made out of mud was also located there. So if it was a Islamic structure or and especially a Muslim structure, you are not supposed to get all this kind of terracotta sculptures because that is haram. It is, I mean, prohibited in an Islamic area. So it was on the basis of this, Professor Bibilal had said, no, below, be, below the mosque that there was a temple. The 13th century marked a sea change in South Asian history with the onset of the Islamic invasion. The first phase of Islamic hegemony continued for 320 years through five generations of the Sultans of Delhi. Avvad, which included Ayodhya, created new political and cultural marks on the Mughal British history. With the death of the last Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb, Avvad came under the local Shia Nawabs for some time. But the advent of colonial hegemony marked the end of the Nawab's era. Ayodhya emerged as a major center of the nationalist movement. The second excavation was carried out in the year 2003 uh, under the directorship of Dr. B. R. Mani. So earlier we had got only te 12 temple pillars, but this time the Archaeological Survey of India got the pillar bases of more than 50 temples. More than 50 pillar bases were excavated from there. This means this was not a small temple, it was a huge temple. And then the pranala was excavated from there. What is a pranala? Pranala because every day you have to do a ceremonial bathing for the pradishta. And then that water goes through, this Abhishega Jala goes through the pranala. So this was a crocodile pranala. Crocodile pranala means crocodile is a symbol of river Ganges. So it was a crocodile pranala. Had it been a mosque, you would not have got this kind of crocodile pranala. And then on the top of the temples, that is North Indian temples, there would be Amalka. That Amalka was excavated from the same site. So neither this Amalka nor this pranala would be, you will not get it from a residential area. It should be only from a temple area. The Nawabs of Lucknow, who had Persian roots, were different from the Sultans of Delhi. Nawab Sadat Ali Khan I was the founder of the autonomous state of Avad in 1724. The first Nawab made Avad the center of political action. Efficient administration doubled the kingdom's annual revenue which pleased the Mughals too. Avad posed an opportunity as well as a challenge to the Mughals. Bangash tribals, Rajputs and Nadir Shah were resisted by Sadat Khan. With tact and strength, yet Khan poisoned himself to death at Delhi's Dara Shukho Mahal. Mirza Muhammad Mukim Ali Khan, Safdar Jung, became the next Nawab who named its capital Faisabad. Nawab's right hand man and Diwan Atmaram and his sons Ram Narayan and Mahanarayan collectively turned Faisabad into a beautiful city. 
the 20,000 strong forces of Afad were expanded. By the time Ahmed Shah Abdalis invaded Delhi, Safdar Jung gave able support to the Mughal throne. This endeared the Nawab more to the Mughals and was made its Grand Vizier. Safdar Jung was also known for his strict morals in stark contrast to other Nawabs known for larger harems. Safdar Jung's wife was Begum Sadrunisa, known later as Nawab Begum. Avad was known for its great women Begums like Nawab Begum and her daughter-in-law Ummat ul Zora, the Bahu Begum. By the time Sardar Jung's son, Shuja and Dola, assumed as the new Nawab of Avad, Northern India was a theatre of war with competing forces. It was a wonderful experience for all of us that we could discover, we could go dive down into the historical antiquity, into the historical past and could be part and parcel of that kind of excavation. But you know, at that time it was not an important issue. That also we should realize. Shuja replaced Lucknow to make Faisabad spectacularly rebuilt even to rival Delhi as the new capital. Poets wrote about Faisabad as a city of music, dance and festivals. Prominent Hindus assumed important positions of power in Shuja's palace. Shuja's demise marked the end of the last golden age of Ayodhya as a center of political power. Lucknow emerged as the new center of Awad. Ayodhya and Faisabad joined nationalist politics. Shuja built a fort in 1764 in the northwest of the city, which was named for Calcutta or Chota Calcutta. The rebuilt Faisabad architecture has the signature of many foreigners. The half moon shaped public market, gardens like Anguri Bagh, Lal Bagh, and Noti Bagh. Safdar Jung had begun the building of Gulab Bari, the Garden of Roses, built on the eastern side of the old market. Mina Bazaar, which was completed by Shuja. The Gulab Bari has the tomes of three Shuja Dola and his parents, Safdar Jung and his wife, Nava Begum. Safdar Jung's remains were later shifted to Delhi and Gulab Bari came to be known as Shuja's Makbara. The first description we have got it from a foreign source that is uh, this one, Abba Fahiyan. So he calls it as Sharsom. And then there is from uh, another description from Huang Sang. So he calls it Vishaka. But it is, I mean, from in our literature, in our literature means in our Puranas, we get the reference as Saket. So Saket, Ayodhya, and uh, these two, uh, that is, it is one and the same thing. 
and uh, on the basis of the explorations also and excavations also it has been proved that it was they were all referring to this place only because it say in this place you know there were several groups of people several denominations of indian religion for example jains were there buddhists were there and many other groups were also there so it has been conclusively that way it is proved they are all referring to saket which is ayodhya even as history was taking ayodhya by storm the nawab begum and bahu begum demonstrated their incredible will power and fortitude they resisted the british who came to loot the great begums partitioned their wealth into three parts even as the british were approaching one part was kept for the maintenance of the royal tombs the second for on charity on the holy days and the last for thousands of their servants to take care of the rest of their lives moti mahal the residence of bahu begum is today battling with time to delay the inevitable the begum had entrusted 1 lakh rupees with the wazir darb ali to build her own tomb after her death that is the bahu begum maqbara now seen at faizabad in a state of dilapidation Even when the fourth Nawab Wazir Asad ud Dola angrily abandoned Faizabad as Awadh's capital and moved it to Lucknow in 1775, these brave women stayed on as the trusted begums of the people of the Saru. History recorded later, while the short-sighted Nawab settled down at Lucknow, two powerful begums led Faizabad. अगर आप कहीं भी जाएं, आप लंदन में जाए आप मिस्र में जाए किसी भी सभ्यता में आप देखें राजा के बराबर कभी रानी नहीं बैठती राजा के सिंहासन के बगल छोटा सा सीट होगी जिस पर रानी बैठेगी सिंहासन पे बराबर से आसन देने की जो बात आज वीमेन लिबरलाइजेशन की है जो जेंडर बायसिंग की बात है जो इक्वेलिटी की बात हम करते हैं सिर्फ राम और सीता बराबर से सिंहासन पे बैठते हैं ये राम जी ने पैदा किया A great patron of art and letters, Asaf ud Dola's court boasted of illustrious poets like Mir, Sauda, Sous, or Insha, who led to the efflorescence of the Urdu language and poetry. Like Awadh's last Nawab, Wajid Ali Shah, Asaf too penned poems, loved and patronized dance and music. He also created thousands of jobs by ordering the construction of the famed Asaf's Imambara to help his subjects survive the great drought of 1784. He deployed European architects and painters like Claude Martin, John Zoffany, and William Hedges to build and beautify Lucknow city. He also was the flag bearer of the Hindu-Muslim hybrid culture. the famed Ganga Jumni Tehzeeb the Awadh Nawab celebrated the Hindu festival of Vasant Panchami at his own darbar it was Sadat Ali Khan who made Holi and Dasera into major festivals Khan had directly participated in the famed Ram Leela of Lucknow one of the greatest Hindu festivals Ayodhya's eclipse as a political center began with the shifting of the capital from Faizabad. This also marked the decline of the Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb and the beginning of the Hindu-Muslim differences fueled deliberately by the British policy to divide and rule. The seeds were sown during those days for the Mandir Masjid conflict. 
Gradually forgotten was the fact that Ayodhya, which now evokes the images of violent conflicts between two communities, has also a great legacy of fraternity. Ayodhya was also the land of Nawabs, who personally performed Krishna Leela and Ram Leela. Nawabs of Avad fought invaders with the able help of his valiant Hindu commanders. Wajid Ali not just provided land to build Ayodhya's legendary Hanuman Garhi temple, but also saved it from the invading Sunni fundamentalists. It was the British who exiled Wajid Ali to Kolkata and ended this great age of fraternity. Hindus and Muslims fought together against the British during the First Indian War of Independence under the legendary leadership of Wajid Ali's Begum, Hazrat Mahal. The friendship and harmony remained vibrant even during the violent days of Partition II when Ayodhya remained as an oasis of peace when fires of communal war raged all around. जहाँ पर सामान्य ढंग से जीवन यापन करने वाले लोग होंगे, छोटे से उसमें रह रहे होंगे, तो वो भी संतोष हैं, एक संतोष का भाव है। तो ये चीज़ मुझे लगता है कि अध्ययन सिखाती है, और इसको डेवलप करने की ज़रूरत है, बड़े स्तर पे। As archaeologists, we have got our own limitations. We are not like historians, we are not like Puranic people, unless and until you get certain substantial evidence from the archaeological excavations, we are not going to believe that one. So, so far we did not receive any, we did not get any kind of evidence that it belongs to the Rama's period or it is associated with the, law, the, the real drama of antiquity. Of course, we only say that uh, the antique, this one below, before the mosque, there was a temple, that's all, and that was a Vishnu temple. So, we limit our exercise to that only. The indelible marks of this syncretic culture lie embedded in Ayodhya's day-to-day -day life even today. Ganga entering into a deep embrace with Yamuna at Allahabad flows to Kashi through this soil. Today, its human power is invested in the building of the new Ram Temple, perhaps unaware and unmindful of what it holds for future of India's political and cultural life. But their dedication is unmistakable, almost as dedicated as the monkey army that built the Setu for Lord Ram to reach Lanka.